Amen. Thank you, Cassandra. Perfect songs for our sermon today. As we look at the love of Christ, as we look at the cross of Christ, which proved his love for us. Amen. So um, I thank God and I'm so grateful for the Holy Spirit and how he works in our midst and prepares our hearts. Amen. For the sermon. So we're going to finish the last part of chapter 2. So uh, from verse 19 to verse 30, I'm going to read the text. Uh, in this chapter, last part, in this section of the chapter, um, we, uh, we are informed by Paul of two young uh, men that traveled with him, that worked with him, that uh, shared in the, in the ministry and, and what God uh, had Paul doing. So at verse 19, we can just kind of uh, read the last part. If you don't mind standing, I'm going to read from 19 to 30. I'm going to go through this section pretty fast because I want to get into ver chapter 3. So um, uh, hopefully we, we can um, make some ground in chapter 3. This is kind of more infor infor information, uh, but it lets us know who the characters are in this particular epistle. And they're Timothy and Epaphroditus. Uh, we'll hear a little bit more about them as we read here. So, verse 19, chapter 2 of Philippians, Paul writes the following, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare, for they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's pr uh, proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing uh, for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill near to death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. We're going to start with this, but let's pray for the sermon. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for uh, your presence here with us and your word. We pray, Lord God, that as we go through this uh, section that we will see, Lord, um, what it is that you would have us to understand, especially, Lord, with Timothy and Epaphroditus at this uh, point, Lord, and see, Lord God, uh, these young men that helped Paul in furthering the gospel. Our prayer, Lord, is that we would have those kind of committed Christians in our midst, those, Lord God, who would uh, be there to support the work of, of the ministry, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, so Timothy and Epaphrodites. These are two young men that followed Paul. There's another place in the epistles where Paul says something that some people find a little bit troubling and, and because they feel that maybe Paul is taking the place that should belong to Christ. And he says to the church, follow me as I follow Christ. And I thought about that and I've heard people mention, well, what do you mean? We're not supposed to be following a man. We're supposed to follow Jesus. But there is those point men that God places in the church, like in this case, apostle, who is this 
His name means sent one. God sent him to this church. Remember when he would rather have gone to Asia and the Lord didn't allow him or permit it and had him wait at Troas. And then he had a vision and he saw the Macedonian call and then he went over to what would be today modern day Greece. And then he was able to establish this church when he met Lydia on that riverside and she became a believer, and it's uh, commented that the church met at her house. So, God sends Paul. Paul has these two young men that are followers, that are helping him more than anything, cooperating with the message of the gospel and the ministry of establishing churches. These two young men that um, um, were collaborating. <laughs> hey, I just want to say thank you to all of you that help me here at this church in the ministry, your service. I just want to say thank you right now for, the, for those of you. And there's so many different ways to do that, right? Uh, I don't want to call out Cassandra, but she comes up here every Sunday and she leads us in worship, right? We have the guys back there. I like to tease them. I call them the bears back there in the sound room, right? They're, 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 there's work being done back there. And they're, and they're doing it for this ministry. And in, of course, as the pastor of this church, they're doing it in, in collaborating with me. And, and there are those in, in our congregation who help in other ways. Uh, there are those who give things uh, um, Gifts and toys and and I mean food maybe in the future right where we were we're talking all the time about how we can further uh, our ministries and what different kinds of ministries we can have here to reach out to the community around us and to touch them for Jesus' sake. So thank you. Every church needs Timothy's, Epaphrodites, and Cassandra's, and Eric's, and you. Every ministry needs it. So I'm thankful. I couldn't do it by myself. Can you imagine me being up here by myself and trying to do everything? I mean, uh, it would be impossible. Nothing would get done. At least it wouldn't get done uh, as efficiently as it is. So real quick, these verses that I read, it, they're summed up, and I want you to know a little bit about them because they're going to be mentioned later. But Timothy joined Paul on his second missionary journey. And... Paul loved him, as we read here, uh, as his own son in the faith. And Timothy had become a messenger from Paul to several churches. So we didn't have, in those days, ways of communication like telephones or, I was going to say fax machines, but who even uses those anymore? Uh, or email or, uh, you know, the ability to text and or be on social media. That didn't exist. If you wanted to communicate with someone else, in this case Paul with some of the other churches, he had to send a person with a letter. And that's how they got this letter, through Epaphrodites. And, and Timothy was also used. You'll find that in the book of Acts. Right? He became a messenger from Paul to other churches. He used him as a pigeon, right? To send messages. That's how they did it. It really would be cool if the U.S. Post Office dedicated a stamp to Paul because he's the first person that made sending letters important. Well, can I say sending important letters? It'd be kind of neat if the post office would dedicate a stamp. I don't know if they have. Does anybody know that? We'll have to do a Google search on that. So Timothy uh, was Paul's um, son in Christ. And he makes uh, some compliments about him here. He says that, uh, uh, for verse 24, I have no one like him. He, he's unique. Paul, Paul is saying this of Timothy. He's, he's giving him a tribute. He's honoring him. It says that at the end, too, um, that they're to do that. Um, and so Timothy uh, here is a son. Timothy here is a messenger. And Paul had uh, a lot of confidence in him to send these letters that we're reading today this man had a, an important part in spreading the gospel 
We have an important part, no matter what our role is in the church, of spreading the gospel, of supporting the ministry that we're willing to sit down at. And thank you, I, by being here faithfully, uh, you're showing me that this is where you think you belong, this is your home church, and, and, and thank you for that confidence. And, and then, therefore, I have the confidence to be able to uh, trust you for whatever ministry God's put in you to do. You see how that works? It's, a, it's one of trust. It's one of love. Relationships don't exist, at least healthy relationships. They can't exist unless there's a love, like a father with a son, in this case, uh, a pastor in his congregation, in our case, right? I, I would see you as my spiritual children. I mean, not that I, you know, I'm not that old per se to be a father, but nonetheless, the point is taken, right? Here we see that he is confident in Timothy's loyalty. What the church needs more of are loyal servants. Just keep being faithful, church. God will use you and He'll honor us and the gospel that we're preaching here every Sunday and Wednesday and whenever we meet. So that's what's going on in the first section here at verse 19 to 24. Uh, Paul's confident in in, uh, in in Timothy and and he uh, he mentions his loyalty and he mentions something interesting there too that uh, there was no one like him who would be genuinely concerned for your welfare. It, it, there's this th there's this loyalty on Timothy's part, while at the same time there were those who seemed to be more concerned about their own interests. So there's always people in our midst that are not, really don't care about you. Let's just put it right out there. And if you think that's bold, wait and see what Paul says in chapter 3, how direct he is. Because the truth must be told, and we must be aware that there are sometimes those that are laboring alongside of us that are not doing it necessarily for your benefit, they're doing it for themselves. Bottom line, they want they're posturing for position or power or influence for whatever reasons. Usually it's self, selfish reasons. But Paul says it right there. There, there were those who, who uh, will be, uh, you know, Timothy will be genuinely concerned for your welfare for they all seek their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. Listen, church, our goal and our objective and at least mine in teaching is that you would be concerned for the interests of Jesus Christ period. I could use you if that's your understanding of your role as a Christian. You are interested only in the things that pertain to Christ. Everything else doesn't matter because it doesn't work, at least in His kingdom, when you put yourself first. As a matter of fact, Jesus taught His disciples said, if you want to be first in my kingdom, then you've got to be last. If you want to be number one, then you've got to be the servant of all. What? That's completely opposite of the way the world works. In the world, when they're jockeying for position and stature and uh, maybe a promotion, they don't have any problem in the world just kicking you down, making sure you stay down, talking about you, gossiping about you, lying about you, whatever they got to do about you, uh, defaming you, berating you, whatever it is, and then they feel real good in their position above you. But not in this kingdom. In this kingdom, those who will be the greatest in the kingdom will be the servant of all. Jesus is an example of that because we just read about that in this very chapter that he became low so that he might go to Calvary's cross so that we might be lifted up out of our bondage and, and out of sin and find a, the opportunity to be reconciled with the Father through the atoning work of Christ. So anyway, that's Timothy, right? What a tribute that... Uh, um, is made here by Paul with that young man. And then the next uh, passage of verses, verses 25 to verse number 30, we find this person called Epaphroditus. Right? He's a member of the Philippian church. He also was a messenger for Paul. As a matter of fact, he came to Paul with some encouragement and a financial uh, blessing to assist him. 
So Epaphroditus comes from Philippi to Paul, but on his way, he gets sick. And we read about that. He almost died. He became ill on his trip to Rome. And uh, when the Philippians had heard about it, they were upset. They were, obviously, because they loved him uh, when they had heard of his illness. And Paul would go on to say that Epaphroditus... Uh, somehow, some way in his bringing this help, this assistance, and this encouragement to Paul, he actually risked his life for the furtherance of the gospel. That's what it says there at the, at the latter end. Right? Indeed, verse 27, uh, near to death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me. And how is it that uh, by sparing Epaphroditus' life, God had mercy on Paul? Because he was there to help Paul. Remember, Paul's in a prison. Paul's locked up. Paul's chained to two guards. Paul's waiting a verdict on, uh, on, on uh, uh, his uh, case that he had before Caesar. Doesn't know what's going to happen. He, he says uh, at verse 23, I, I will send, hopefully, uh, him to you, uh, referring to Timothy, as soon as I see how it will go with me. He had no idea what was going to happen to him. He was hoping that he would survive and he would be set free, but he wasn't. We don't know. We have no idea what God's going to do in our lives. But we can, and again, it's a cliche, and I said it last Sunday. I'm going to say it again this Sunday, because in spite of the fact that it's a cliche, it's true. We, we don't know the future, but we do know who holds the future. So put your trust in the Lord, and you won't be let down. Amen? I don't know what what your situation is, and Paul didn't know what his would be either. So I think it's interesting to see here, Paul then uh, recognizes Epaphroditus as, his, uh, as, a, as a messenger, and because the Philippians had heard that he had gotten sick and was literally on his deathbed, and yet God mercifully raised him up and healed him, he says, hey, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to send him back your way. Because I, I see that you're worried about his condition, so I want you to see him. He's coming back to you. So this is Christian love. This is how it works. They send Epaphroditus, that is the church at Philippi, to Paul to assist him and with a little financial assi- uh, help, right, a little gift. And then you know, on his way he gets sick and almost dies. And then he does serve and help Paul in his condition and where he's at. And then Paul, because he understands that the Philippians were saddened to hear of the struggles that Epaphroditus was having, so he sends them back. Wow. Is there love in there somewhere? Or is there the Christian way there for us to see and model? Yes, we're to be concerned about each other. Amen? Go out of your way to help someone in this building right now. Look around, you guys. Go around and ask them if they're okay. And if there's something you can do, you're only responsible as, and before the Lord to help them only as much as you can. Never beyond what you're able to do, but what you're able to do, do it. He'll never ask of you what you can't give, but He will require of you, and He will ask of you. And not only that, because you have a love of Christ in your heart, you're going to do what you can to help the person that you know has a need because isn't that what Christ did for us? And he saw us in our sinful condition, falling without any hope of ever being able to free ourselves from the penalty of sin, which is death. Jesus himself comes and enters into this world in human form. He reduces himself to a man being the eternal one the King and King and Lord of Lords, and he takes upon himself the sin of the world at Calvary's cross. What makes that so impressive are two things. First, who did this for us? The one and only Jesus, King of King and Lord of Lords, and whom he did it for? Sinners. We're not deserving of it. And yet he did it for us. And then that's where in his humility he shows us how service works, how ministry works. We cannot ever be effective ministers and we cannot ever do anything for the cause of Christ without humility. Jesus, when he came, 
And when he was prepared at age 30 or so to begin his ministry, he had John the Baptist as the forerunner prophet, the one who would declare, make straight the path. The king is coming, paraphrasing. He saw Jesus and he said, I must decrease that he may increase. And the prophet Jesus, uh, John the Baptist, called him the greatest of all prophets because he's the one that ushered in his ministry. And John the Baptist was nothing, wanted to be nothing, considered himself nothing in the presence of the Lord. That's what we do. We hide behind those of us that are pastors, those of us that are teachers, those of us that are ministering. We hide behind the cross and hopefully the only thing you see, I can't hide that much behind this one, the only thing you see is not Pastor Robert, but you see Jesus in the ministry of people. All right. So that's the story of these two young men that were Paul's helpers, that cooperated with Paul. Chapter 3. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. So now he gets right back to the theme of this letter. Finally. Now, he's not done with the chapter. There's more chapters. You would think, finally, it's like almost maybe, you know, I don't want to say it, you know, because I you know, hate to put anyone on the spot, but there might be someone here that's going, when is this finally over, this sermon? And pastor said, finally, I heard it. That must mean he's on his last point. Well, Paul says finally, but he's still got way more to go. So a classic preacher, right? Say, hey, I'm almost done, but you know, not really, we're not. We're not done. I'm not done. I'm just starting. I'm warming up. That was just the introduction. Finally, my brothers, he speaks to the church as a family. Right? We're the family of God. You guys know that, right? We're the family of God. We have one thing in common, our Heavenly Father. When we become believers, He's our Heavenly Father. And we're all adopted into His family. We're fa Did I say we were family? Okay, I just want to make that point. Family, brothers, obviously included are the sisters. He says, rejoice in the Lord. And it's interesting, He doesn't command them to rejoice in their circumstances whether they be good or bad. No, he doesn't do that. We're to rejoice in the what? Someone say it loud. Okay, I'm going to say it again and see if we can capture this. We're to rejoice in the... We're to rejoice in the... Lord. In the Lord. Not our circumstances, whether they be good or bad, right? And, again, I mean, those, those circumstances that you're going through right now, they could be bleak, and uh, I don't know, uh, just depending on uh, each individual person, they could be brutal. But he's saying rejoice in the Lord anyway. Why? Because we have the Lord. Right? He, he understands that the Lord is with him in his circumstances in Rome, and he understands that the Lord is with you wherever you may be in spite of whether what your circumstances look like, favorable or not. Whether they look bleak or brutal. And sometimes that's the case for us. But rejoice in the Lord nonetheless because God stands with us in those circumstances, right? And He will cause something good no, I get it. It's hard to believe sometimes. He will cause something good to come from those circumstances ultimately. Because he will say to the Romans, this one very popular verse in chapter 8, verse 28, right? But God works out all things for good to those that love him and are called according to his purposes. What does it mean that God works out? That all things work together for good, depending on your translation. It means that God intervenes wherever you're at and with whatever you're experiencing or going through. Not 
that you're rejoicing in that circumstance, but in that circumstance, God works it out. He intervenes. He enters into your particular situation, and He's going to, sooner or later, make good of it. There are two conditions, though. You must love the Lord and must understand that you want to be in His will and His purposes. That's the only way it works. When you have a love relationship with Him and you're committed, committed, committed. <laughs> I had a long night last night, so bear with me. That's just to, get, I just said that for emphasis. You know, I, know, I know how to speak. I know grammar. When you're committed to His purpose, God enters into all things. God works in all things. You mean all things? Yeah, all things. You mean my things? Yeah, your things. But you don't know my things. I don't know them probably, all things. Your th but he does. Amen? Isn't that true, church? Yolanda, you agree? Good. I feel like I can move on. Okay. If, if Yolanda agrees, I can move on. Okay. So, he says, I, to, he says, Swami, my brother, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble for me or to me, and is safe for you. What? To write the same things to you is no trouble. I feel so good, because what Paul is saying is, I know I'm repeating myself, and he will say this, rejoice in the Lord, like 19 times in this letter. He says, I don't have a problem. It's no trouble for me to remind you of the joy that we have in Jesus. I feel so much better. Because someone told me once, I'm extra. Said, what does that mean? He said, man, you repeat yourself so much. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to get the point across. <laughs> Paul's trying to get the point across too. He says, hey, to write the same things to you is no trouble to me and it's safe for you. It's safe for you in that it's healthy for you. If you're going to hear something, hear this. It's better to rejoice in the Lord than to not rejoice in the Lord because it's better than being bitter. That's what he's saying. Amen? Anybody? Amen. And he's saying here that uh, he doesn't have a problem reminding them that we're to have joy in Christ because we Know, number one, that we can rest in His completed work, because He mentioned already that we're His workmanship, that He that has begun a good work, He will complete it. What He started, He'll bring it to the finish line. He's not done with us. He's working through us. Amen. We've seen it already mentioned. And then the other thing, too, is that He's present with us. In other words, we're not going through this life by ourselves. We're not experiencing these things alone. He, he's our ever-present uh, companion. Let me say that again. Jesus is our ever-present companion. He ever lives to make intercession for us. He's our advocate. He's our lawyer. He's our mediator before the Father. He's concerned about us. He's interceding on our behalf. And if Jesus is our representative, if you will, then we're okay. But we do have to go through trials and tribulation in this life because this is not our home we're just a passing through as the old hymn says amen but we're passing through amen so he he, he doesn't have any problem re remember, having them remember that they're to let their hearts sing a new song of praise did you hear what i said you need to let your heart Sing new songs of praises. What do you mean, let? Because it's up to you. Your attitude determines your altitude. If you choose to think and to dwell and to murmur and complain on the negative, then that's on you because then that's what you're allowing. Or if you choose to take God's Word or the words of this pastor right here preaching from God's Word and says, you know what, I'm going to believe that to be true and I'm going to do what the Lord says. God help me. Holy Spirit, allow me to have the power and the strength to do so. And guess what? You will be able to do it because you're not alone. He's with us. Always. Thank you, Sarah. Always. 
You want to get up here and preach with me? Amen. <laughs> She's like, no, thank you. I stay right. Yeah. I say, right. Amen. Okay. So, yeah, um, you can stay there, Sarah. Oh, well, I'll, go, I'll go at you from here. How about that? I like these interactive sermons where there's a little bit of participation. Then Paul does something. He takes kind of a little bit, bit of a turn here. He kind of changed subjects and he gets to some content here that has to do with a warning against false teaching. The Bible here, you'll see, is very direct and blunt. There is a place to be direct. There is a place to be straight up as, as, as concerning uh, uh, what the Bible teaches us. There is not a place necessarily to be rude and nasty, but to be direct, to be blunt, may offend someone, but we could it in a way that which we are making the truth known and we should never hide the truth and in this particular case Paul's dealing with those who had come in had crept into the church after he had left the, this area of Philippi and they begin to contradict his message they begin to say things that weren't true so he's addressing them here right he calls them out and look what he says it's pretty impressive Look out. Or you could say beware. Look out for the dogs. Huh? Calls, Paul's calling the false teacher dogs. That's strong. But they are. Look out and look what he says about them. For the evildoers. Not only is their message evil, what the, what, while preaching their message, they're doing evil. And I'll explain why in a minute. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. Now, I don't know about you, but this is pretty straight up and pretty straightforward. Paul, apostle that God sent to the Gentiles, who established a church in Philippi, left it in the hands of the elders, healthy, hears about these intruders, these false teachers, who are speaking lies, calls them dogs. <laughs> Man, sometimes you just got to call what it is what it is. Yep. But, Where's the love of Jesus? That is the love of Jesus. Because otherwise, if they follow the words and the teaching of those false intruders, they will lose the blessing that Paul had brought them. They will return or go back to the old system that does not save. That is love. It is love when you point people back to Christ. Because otherwise, without Christ, we're doomed. That is love. Amen? It is appropriate when after having gone for a checkup with your doctor, discovers a tumor, it is appropriate for him to let you know so that you can start treatment or whatever. And it would be inappropriate for him not to tell you that you have a tumor because your feelings might get hurt or he might upset you and then allow you to die and not be able to get the help you need. There is a time, church, for the truth to be spoken directly and bluntly. And Paul calls them dogs. Well, I like something I read in a commentary. And it says, Behind the lying bark of these intruders is a grievous bite. That's why he calls them dogs. What do dogs do? They bark. But if that's all they do, then, you know, whatever, they're annoying. You know, someone call the 
Humane Society and get that dog to shut up over there next door. Man, I can't get no sleep. That's one thing, to be annoyed. But it's a whole other thing when that dog bites you and injures you. Amen? So I like, I like it. I think it explains the, the, the word dogs. Behind the lying bark of these intruders, false teachers that came in, is a grievous bite. Does it make sense now what Paul's doing here? You're protecting your family, your children, from getting bitten by dogs. Who wouldn't say, bravo? Yeah, you protect your own. I don't know, you guys hear me? Pastor protects his flock from what? Wolves. Amen? A mother, a father protects their children from wolves. Period. Otherwise, you're a coward. And otherwise, you have handed over your heirs to those that would do you harm. I didn't have an idea I was going to say all this this morning. But I'm looking at Paul here and I'm saying, wow, what a man of God. He loves his congregations that he founded. The specific error here is circumcision. Okay, let's just get to that. Because you might ask, well, what, what were they saying or what were they doing? He, well, they're not only dogs, but then he identifies these dogs as evildoers. They're doing evil. What evil were they doing? They were preaching circumcision. And you might think, well, what's so wrong about that? Because what they were doing is they were trying to mingle the works of the flesh with the simplicity of faith as a condition for salvation. There isn't anything you can do to save yourself. No matter what you do to your flesh, Cut it or not. Mutilators is what he called them. Because the message of salvation is simply faith in what Christ has already accomplished for us. He flatly rejects any compromise in this area. What's a little circumcision here and there? You know, all I got to say about that is Ouch! Right? Mutilators. Paul identifies them. What's the problem? Mixing grace with works. With human effort. With human merits. With the merits and with the efforts and with the work of Christ on the cross. What you're saying is, people, is what Jesus did wasn't enough. What Jesus did isn't sufficient. What Jesus did didn't complete what was necessary for your redemption. You've got to save yourself by doing this, that, and the other thing. And let's start off by circumcision, which was something in the Old Testament that identified God's calling of Abraham and separated him and distinguished him from the rest of the nations by that token, if you would, that he would do in obedience, but it didn't save him. He still was a father of faith. But it made him the father of a holy nation, a peculiar nation, a nation of priests, a nation that belonged to the Lord, Israel. That's the point of it then. That's no longer valid in the New Testament because there was one who was circumcised. It was Christ when His flesh was cut on that cross. And then when we come to Christ, our hearts are cut as we love Him, as we understand our need to repent and to turn to Him. There's a big difference here. Amen? So, true circumcision is not a mark on the flesh. It's a mark in the heart. Look what he says. For we are the circumcision. Verse 3. We're those that have the mark in our heart. 
cut to the heart to use a I guess we could call it a simile something similar has happened in the spiritual realm that would have happened in the physical realm in the Old Testament covenant but in the New Testament covenant the mark the cut is to the heart it's where he deals with us now in the heart it's a heart matter now right he says it for we are the circumcision some translations say the true circumcision who worship God by the what? Or who worship by what? Spirit. We don't worship by the flesh. We worship by the Spirit. Right? And when we worship by the Spirit and glory in Christ Jesus, when we worship God in the Spirit, we give glory to Christ Jesus, not to ourselves. We can't say, look what I've done. Oh, wow, I'm amazing. You're so lucky to be married to me because I'm fabulous. Oh, children, you don't know how great it is to have me as your mom and dad. Because I'm awesome. I'm all that. No, 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 no. Nothing, to, nothing like that. It says here that we are the true circumcision, the ones who have the mark, not in the flesh, but in our hearts. The ones that we have been cut to the heart. In other words, God's been able to penetrate into our hearts. And we responded to that calling. We responded to His wooing. We responded to His love and what He did for us at the cross from our heart in a spiritual sense. And then He's saying there is we worship by the Spirit of God and the glory in Christ Jesus. And what else do we do? We put what? No. At capital N-O. No confidence in the what? Flesh. No confidence in our merits. No confidence in our works. No confidence in what we do or don't do. All of our confidence all of our faith is in what Jesus has done for us at the cross of Calvary. Hmm? Hmm. Those who are of the spiritual circumcision Believe that salvation is all about grace through faith. The sinner simply receives Christ as Savior. And that's it. And that's all we can do. Man, I'm making it so simple. Because it is. Again. Those of us that are of this circumcision and who worship by the Spirit of God for the glory of Christ and put no confidence in the flesh are those that understand that salvation is all about grace through faith. Amen? Un God's unmerited favor. And we then believe, we assent to it, we agree in our mind, and we assent to it, we act as though that's true and we live believing that what Jesus did is sufficient and we put no confidence whatsoever in the flesh or in ourselves because here you go people it's all about Jesus and all to his glory and it is never about ourselves ever ever never Wow. What a privilege to be able to preach this message. I cannot believe it. I really can't. Thank you so much, Lord, for calling me. I won't compromise either. I want you to know your pastor is. I might have some weaknesses, and some of you that know me better and longer may know, might be able to identify him, but who cares? I have the desire to do what Paul's doing here. I want you to understand. It's all about Jesus. It's never about us. It's not complicated. It's not rocket science. You simply put your trust in the finished work of Christ. And that's it. We worship God by the Spirit of God and 
for the glory of Christ Jesus and we put no confidence in the flesh. Now, do you know that there are some people that do put their confidence in their flesh? Yeah, there were those preachers, those intruders, those false teachers who came in and said that, hey, that's really, really nice that you believe in Jesus and this whole thing about you're saved by grace through faith. That's really cool, guys. But guess what? It's not enough. You've got to do this and do that. And let's start by circumcising you if you have not been circumcised. By the way, these were Gentiles that know nothing about the Old Covenant. Right? That's reserved for Israel. And yet they're trying to get them to also observe all of the other uh, rules and regulations that flow out of the Old Covenant. Like... We've seen in Galatians. And here, Jesus says, or rather, Paul says in verse 3, we are those who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. And then Paul says, but let me play the game. And I want to wrap this up after this in a little bit. You still got a little bit of time. I'm not boring, you guys, am I? No? Okay, good. Well, that's awesome. Paul then directs his attention in uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 4. Paul now says, hey, if any of my contemporaries have, believe or might have confidence in the flesh, if you're going to brag on yourself then uh, I have far more reason to be confident. Basically what he's saying is, hey, I'll put my record against theirs any day. So let's just play a game here. Uh, I, we can say devil's advocate. Paul is kind of going to go with the flow of what they were teaching, right? If you're going to trust in yourself, if you're going to look at yourself as a contributor, to, a contributor of your salvation, or if you're going to say that we have to participate somehow, some way, and be able to secure a righteousness before God, let's talk about that. And he kind of goes into this, what he would say later in some of his other epistles. Let me play the fool for a while, because this is exactly what it is. And let me put my record up against yours. So in Philippians 3, chapter four, uh, verse 4, uh, he says, Though I myself have ris re reason for confidence in the flesh also, now that we're talking about having confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks, that's his contemporaries, he has reason for confidence in the flesh. I have more. So let's compare. All right? Let's compare trophies. All right? Let's compare diplomas. Hey, let's compare grades. GPAs. This is what he's doing here. I have more, he says, if we're going to go based on achievement, personal achievement as the criteria for salvation. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 4, I have more. And he says, circumcised on the eighth day, completely and in agreement with the law of the people of Israel, Israelite, Specifically of the tribe of Benjamin, by the way, the tribe of Benjamin has a unique place in history. It's the only tribe that stayed with Judah when the northern tribe rebelled and went into exile. When we talk about Judah, when we talk about the people that Jesus came to in his, when he was born, it was the two tribes that still survived in the south, Judah and Benjamin. When we talk about the first king of Israel, who was it? Saul. 
Okay, so he's now listing, if we're going to go with putting confidence in the flesh, if we're going to go with human achievements, if we're going to do, if we're going to base this on birth, by the way, I'm a blue blood, he's saying, because what? I was circumcised the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and on top of that, a Hebrew of Hebrews going beyond and further back than Abraham. Abraham was a Hebrew, right? And now that we're talking about performance, the law, I'm a Pharisee. I belong to the right party. Political party. Pharisee, right? I was one of 70. There were only 70 Pharisees in a council. I'm one of them. And as to righteousness under the law, I could be considered blameless. Now that is exteriorly speaking, not interiorly speaking. The law was about external performance. Grace and salvation in the new covenant is about internal transformation. You must be born again. We are new creatures in Christ. The old has passed away. Not external things, internal things. The heart, back to the heart. The true circumcision are those that have been cut to the heart. Those that have mark of God's presence in their heart. That's a true circumcision. So, when it comes to virtue on the, for the basis of salvation, Paul can brag with his contemporaries that came into the church of Philippi saying that you needed to mix works with the message of grace and salvation by faith. So he does something interesting in here. He reviews his own heritage. He reviews his own behavior. He lists his birth. He lists his culture. He lists his ability. And he says, I have many more gain, things that I've gained if we're going to base salvation on that criteria. If it comes to a law righteousness through merits, if it comes through rituals and ceremony, or does it come solely through a righteousness that's through faith? This is the argument here. And he says, no, it is only by receiving the righteousness of Christ that's imputed to us, which means cre accredited to us, and it's only possible to receive it through the vehicle of faith alone. Because faith is accepting something someone else has done and it's receiving it as a gift. We have, have no part in our salvation except saying yes. That's what he's doing here. And I really love it because... If we're going to talk about a career, man, I don't know of too many that were like Paul's. If we're going to talk about titles, right? If we're going to talk about degrees, I'm talking about educational degrees. If we're going to talk about credentials, if we're going to talk about a socioeconomic status, or party affi affiliation, what Paul is actually saying is it doesn't matter. Right? Oh, by the way, neither does sincerity matter for the basis of our salvation. You could be, well, he said that he was zealous above all. Let me read it again. Verse 6. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. So if we're going to talk about sincerity or morality because he was righteous under the law, blameless. Paul is going to give us an explicit verdict. Look what he says in verse 7. But whatever gain I had, whether it's my birth, my culture, my abilities, whatever I gain by being a Pharisee or credentials or socioeconomic status or party affiliation, whatever gain I had, look at verse 7. This is the key to the, this epistle. I counted it as loss for the sake of Christ. Hmm. He's basically saying, based on my legalistic days and religious days, 
even though I knew about God theologically and intellectually, I only want to know Him now intimately. How does this happen? Because nothing can compare, in that list I just gave you, to the excellency of knowing Christ personally. That's what Paul's saying. Why did his pedigree mean nothing to him? Why does his religious, ceremonial, all of his merits mean nothing to him? Because what he found in Jesus was infinitely superior to what he had given up. You will never earn, you will never hold on to anything in this life that is superior to Christ. You can never give up anything that's better than Christ, is what Jesus is saying. He goes on to say, for, I, for his sake, that is for Christ, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. Trash. In order that I might gain Christ and be found in him. Those gains that I had before, Pharisee, Hebrew, Benjamite, Israelite, circumcised on the eighth day, all those gains that I had, he says, he had counted them as loss. And, who, and what he wanted to gain, now notice, here's the focus. What he wanted to gain was Christ. To be found in Christ. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that it depends on faith. We have a faith righteousness, not a law righteousness. So when you become a Christian, Christ dressed you in His righteousness. The Father sees you through the lens of Christ. We cannot approach God the Father. We cannot find forgiveness. We cannot find a reconciliation. We cannot be restored in a relationship with the Father except we go through Christ, the one who paid the debt that we could not pay even though He did not own it. Uh, he did not have any debts. He did it for our sake. So we have a righteousness that's through Christ. Christ's righteousness, when we express faith in His finished work of the cross, is accredited to us. It goes into our bank account. It's deposited into our account for Christ as ours. He dresses us in the righteousness of Christ and the Father sees us only through, if you would, these glasses being Christ. He cannot see us only like this. He must see us through His Son. As one commentator said many years ago, and I read and I never forgot it, God sees us through the spectacles of Christ. This is what glasses used to be called. And only through Christ. That's why Paul rejoices. That's why this is the epistle of joy. It's all been done for us. All we need to do is recognize that we're sinners, ask for forgiveness, and receive Christ in our hearts by faith for what He has done for us at the cross. He says that I may know Him and the power of His, righteous, of his resurrection and may share His sufferings, become like Him in His death, and that by any means possible I might attain to the resurrection from the dead. So Jesus is just not a man who merely lived 2,000 years ago. And then that's the end of the story. Oh no, that's the beginning of the story. He is he whom said, I am the way. He is the one who said, I am the life. I am the resurrection. And we want and should desire to know that Jesus 
intimately and personally. And you can. So let's bow our heads. Father, thank you. Thank you for helping us see what matters. Helping us see, Lord, uh, even a man with all of the credentials of Paul would consider all of those things, whether it be his birth, whether it be his abilities, whether it be his uh, training, uh, uh, whether it be, Lord, uh, uh, his practice of, of um, ceremonies and rituals and all of those things from the Old Covenant. Thank you for showing us, Lord, that he had arrived in the gospel to teach us, Lord, that all that matters is what Jesus has done. And that is sufficient. My prayer, Lord, this morning is that if there's anyone here who's not received Christ in their heart by faith, that they would do so right now, this very moment. How is this done? We know, Lord, that it's done by the Holy Spirit and through your word. And having heard this message, my prayer, Lord, is that there would be that person whose heart has been dealt with could simply by faith take a stand and receive Christ. Lord, recognizing his need for a Savior, the forgiveness of his sins, so that then he might be joined into the family of God, that he may be reconciled with his, uh, with his maker, with and through the Savior. Really isn't that complicated. It can be done right now where we're sitting, where only you see hearts, when only you know thoughts, and the sincerity of them, and the honest evaluation of our lives. We simply come to you, Lord, and we bow, and we confess. You are Lord, we confess our sins, and you forgive us, because you're faithful and just to forgive us, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's not hard. What makes it difficult, Lord, is that we have to surrender. But isn't that the point, Lord, that we have reached an understanding, Lord, that there's anything we can do, no matter what. It would be a futile and a vicious circle that we would live in, a miserable circle that we would live in going nowhere. And that's, that's where we are when we don't know you. But thank you, Father, for the hope we have in Christ. If there's anyone, Lord, our prayer, Lord, is that they would say yes to Christ's redeeming work at Calvary's cross. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.